this is how we overcome. Revelation chapter 12, beginning in verse 7, the Bible said there was war in heaven. Everybody say there was war in heaven. If there's war in heaven, how much more will there not be war on earth? We have this tendency to believe either one way or another about, about war as it relates to spiritual warfare. And we certainly know that Christ has conquered. We know that he is king. We know that he has prevailed. We know that he's made an open spectacle out of Satan. We know that he has overcome. But the fact is there's still a battle that's taking place today. And the scripture says that you and I do not war against flesh and blood, but we war against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places and just like in a military uh, setting there are ranks and there's authorities and there's powers and it's all delegated from above the same thing is in the spiritual realm guys there's delegated spiritual authority and there's spiritual authority and warfare that's going on on every level but you need to understand something God has given you and I dominion over the earth God did not call or create the enemy to conquer or overcome he has called us to overcome he has called us to prevail. He has given us his authority. He has given us his power to be able to have victory upon this earth. We know that the Bible says that in the book of Acts that they delivered them from the power of Satan unto the power of God. That is our responsibility. We bring people out from under the influence, the demonic realm of influence of the prince of the power of the air, air and we bring them into the light of the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We preach light into the darkness and light dispels darkness. Are y'all with me today? We are to walk in the light. As we walk in the light, as he is in the light, then that light radiates and illuminates through us that we shine light in the darkness. The only way that darkness can exist is an absence of light. So therefore, when we walk in God's will, we live in the center of his purpose. We dispel a light that call, or we, we produce a light that dispels the darkness out of the world. Come on, church. This is why it's so important that we don't fall into that trap of, well, I went to an altar and I got saved and everything's supposed to get better because I got saved. This is not the New Testament. It is not the New Covenant. We are to be followers of Christ. We are to walk in Christ. We are to live in Christ. We are to walk in the light as he is in the light. We are to put our hands to the plow and never look back. We are to continue in our faith. Continuing in our faith is not a continuance in an acknowledgement that I believe in Jesus, but is continuing in a life of obedience to God and to the will of the Holy Spirit for us. That's why Romans 6 it says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. How many of you know that sons have an inheritance? And we are the sons of God. We're not the sheep of God. We're the sons of God. Everybody preaches sheep. Israel was sheep. We're sons. Come on, church. We've been grafted in. That's why we call him Abba Father, because we are the sons and daughters of God. And those that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of daughters of God. And we have an inheritance. We have a power. We have an assignment. We have a purpose. God wonderfully made you in your mother's womb. You're not an accident. You're not a mistake. You're not just happenstance today. God made you. He's got a purpose in your life. He has a calling on your life and he is changing you from glory to glory to glory as you fulfill that purpose of God for your life. And in that purpose is where your joy will be found. In that purpose is where your victory will be found. In that purpose is where you'll find that overcoming power to prevail every day. It's in that purpose that God takes your frailty and makes it adequate it takes your inability and gives it supernatural ability. It's in that purpose that you will begin to find the fulfillment of God, that you don't need all the things in this world and God. God becomes your all in all, your living water, your bread out of heaven. Kono, he becomes everything. He becomes your contentment and your fulfillment. And the things of this world begin to fall off of you. The desires of this world begin to fade away. And the struggles that you battled with yesterday, you won't battle with tomorrow if you walk in the will of God because those things lose their strongholds over your life when you walk in the will and the purpose of God every day. And you get stronger and stronger. And if we don't grow up in Christ and mature and walk in his will, then we're going to continue to be walk and we're going to be uh, we're going to continue to be weak and we're going to walk in the lust of the flesh and we're going to walk in the weaknesses of our old fleshly life. But the more that we walk with Christ, the stronger we get, the more power we have, the more sustainability we have, and those things fall off of our life. If you want to change, follow Jesus. If you want your life to become better, follow Jesus. It'll change every facet of who you are. 
It'll cause you to lose that old personality. It'll cause you to lose those old desires. But if you disconnect from the vine, let me tell you what Jesus said in John 15, you're going to wither. Everybody say you're going to wither. And the Bible says when you wither, you're cut off and you're cast out. And the Bible said men gather you. If God's not your influencer, people will be. I'm going to say it one more time. If God's not your influencer, people will be. And when you don't abide in Jesus, you become weak to his influence. And people start influencing you. People start, peer pressure starts affecting you because you're not abiding in the vine. And sometimes you don't have to be trashed out, high on drugs, laid up on a street corner, drunk somewhere to be out of God's will. Sometimes it's because you refuse to walk in the call and the purpose of God for your life. Because you refuse to pull yourself up by the bootstrap someday when you don't feel like it and persevere on. It's when you allow things in your life that you know God said is wrong, but you won't allow God to change you in those areas. But guys, when we make up our mind, I may not feel it, but I'm going after God. If I fall down, I'm going to get up. If I'm weak, I'm going to stand in his strength. When I don't think I can, I'm going to stand and say, God, you can. And we persevere beyond it. It's not by emotions. It's not by feeling. It's by faith, guys. And when we push on by faith, we grow stronger and stronger in our walk with God. So the Bible said there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against the angels. And somebody say they prevailed not. Neither was their place found in, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, and the old serpent, the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out of earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of God, and the power of Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down. Everybody say he's cast down. Which accused them, now watch this, which accused them before God day and night. And they overcame him. Say that with me, they overcame him. By the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto death. <clears throat> what you must first understand about Satan is Satan is a deceiver. Satan is the greatest deceiver of all. The Bible says that he was more cunning than all the beasts of the field. And here's the challenge that you and have. When Satan comes in, we usually don't recognize him. He comes in subtly. That means he comes in unrecognizable. He comes in in ways through people and friends and people that we trust, people that we love in every way that we can possibly imagine. He knows your weaknesses more than you know yourself. Let me tell you why he knows who you are. Because you're far more important to God than you realize. Most people think we're just saved to go to heaven, but I got news for you. You're not saved to simply go to heaven. You're saved according to the purpose of God. You're saved according to the plan of God. You're saved to be the temple of God. You're saved to be the body of Christ that God can do his bidding and carry out his will on the earth. That's why the Bible said when you pray, pray this way. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And you are the conduit that God gets the will done on the earth. And without you, God don't have a way of getting his will done because he changed chose to walk in a covenant with you and I that he chose to operate through the frailty of flesh. God wants to turn the world upside down, but he wants to do it through you. Can, can, are y'all hearing me preach today? And that's why so many people don't walk in the strength and the joy of their salvation because they don't understand it's not about me. It's not just about what God did for me, but it's about what God did through me to do, or, or in me to do through me. Let me, let me get that. It's what God did in me to do through me. So it's not just about that it's all about me. It's about what contribution am I making back to the kingdom of God? What part am I playing in walking in the will of God for my life? Jesus made it clear, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of God, but those who do the will of my Father. You've got to do the will of God every day. You've got to follow God. That means you've got to be in relationship with God. And that's what the enemy is after, is your devotion and your relationship with God. Because he knows the moment that you begin to walk in the will of God, that you begin to grow spiritually, that you begin to grow maturing in Christ Jesus, that Christ, according to Ephesians 4, becomes formed in you. At that moment, you have become a threat to the enemy. You have become a sustaining power that is greater than his power so he will do everything that he can to keep you from growing spiritually he wants to pull you away from your sincere devotion to Jesus that's why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians eleven three, Paul writes to the Corinthian church it says I fear everybody say I fear 
<clears throat> Notice he says, I fear. A lot of people say that there's supposed to be no fear, but yet Paul prayed and said, I fear that somehow your pure, undivided devotion to Christ, say that with me, your pure, undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of the serpent. Now, if you read that text on, you'll find that that comes through false teachers, it comes through false prophets, and it comes through people. So in, in, in some way, that people are going to cause us to pull our focus and our attention, our dedication, and our singular commitment to Christ away and cause it to become divided. Are y'all following me? In other words, I want you to give part of your devotion to something else in your life. Anger, hurt, offense, dissatisfaction, something in this world, some lust of your flesh. He's trying to pull you away from being totally 100% sold out and committed to Jesus. He wants to discourage you, distract you, get you wounded, get you disheartened. He wants to get you in any kind of condition that he can mentally and emotionally that will cause you to draw back from God because the Bible says that God takes no pleasure in those that draw back. So if he can sneak into your life, offend you, get you upset, get you twisted, get you undedicated, cause problems in your health, cause problems in your business, cause problems in your marriage, cause problems in your family, with your children, anything he can do to get you from pullback from the word, from prayer, from obedience and submission to God's will, he is after you. Are y'all following me today? Is this message coming across okay? He's trying to pull you away. He's trying to get you disheartened because he don't want you to follow him because if you follow him, you're going to grow up. If you follow him and you keep following him, you're going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. You're going to have a better attitude. Your behavior is going to change. Your character is going to start changing. Your anointing is going to start flowing. God's going to start using you, and your life is going to find purpose and it's going to find meaning, and the devil is scared to death that you're going to be a sold-out believer. The enemy doesn't want you. He wants you to sit in a pew and be comfortable going to church. He wants you to sit in a pew and be comfortable being a mundane, average Christian. But God didn't call us to mediocrity. God called us to be more than conquerors. He called us to be overcomers. He has called us to prevail. He has called us to be sold out. He has called us to be cross carriers. He has called us to walk in resurrection power. He has called us to be the reflection of his own self. Woo. And if we don't, guys, I'm telling you, we're not going to win this battle. God needs some sold-out warriors. So the enemy is a deceiver. And the problem is we're twisted and cross-traded with junk in our life, offenses with other people, caught up in political junk, caught up in offenses, caught up in distractions with our work, with our family, with our health, and we don't persevere, and we get caught up, and the enemy's got our focus, and we're not praying like we were. We're not sold out like we were. We're not worshiping like we were. We're not serving like we were. We're not ministering like we were. Why? Because the enemy slapped you somewhere, wounded you, hurt you, distracted you, and you drew back. But the Bible said God takes no pleasure in those that draw back. Guys, it is time to, to gird up as good soldiers. It's time to stand up and draw upon the power of God and march forth in the victory that he has for our life. So the Bible says he's a deceiver. Everybody says he's a deceiver. You've won the minute you recognize him for who he is. Let me tell you what somebody that is deceived. Let me just share this because I feel the Holy Spirit wants me to say this to you today. First of all, Somebody that is deceived thinks the wrong that they're doing is right. Let me say it again. A person who is deceived thinks that the wrong that they're doing is right. It makes right seem wrong and wrong seem right. And you believe with your heart I'm doing the right thing when in all in all the enemy has you blinded. That's the reason the Bible said that we bring them out of the darkness in the light from the power of Satan to the power of God. Because the enemy is deceived. He's the master of deception. He blinds our eyes. And sometimes we got to go blind before we can see. And listen, many times we don't know we're deceived. Let me, let me show you something in the Bible. Many times we don't know that we're deceived until it's too late. Everything the Bible writes about spiritual warfare is not written to lost people. Do you realize that the Bible was not written to a lost and a dying world? 
that every letter in the Bible was not written to the lost world. It was written to the church. It was written to the church of Ephesus, the church of Colossae. It was written to all of the different believers, the church at Corinth. It was written to people who were followers of Jesus. So all the warnings about Satan was not to a lost world. The warnings of Satan was to the church. Why do you think the Bible said that the devil comes as a wolf in sheep's clothing? Because he has to disguise himself to get in amongst us. The Apostle Paul writes in Acts, or, 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 or the writer of, of, of Acts writes concerning the Apostle Paul, and he said, At my departure, grievous wolves will come in from among you, not sparing the flock. At the absence of his authority and the absence of his, of his watchful care over the congregation, the wolves begin to come in, and they scatter the flock, and men would draw disciples unto themselves. Are y'all following? Because that's what happens. The enemy seduces people and deceives them to cause them to walk away from their sincere, undivided devotion to Jesus. Are y'all with me? To get split, to be plucked out of the place that God planted them, to pull them away from the body that they're joined to. And he gets them all messed up for whatever way and reason that he can. So we need to understand and be aware the enemy is after us. He went after Peter. Watch this. Peter was a follower of Jesus. And the Bible said that Peter spoke to Jesus when he was about to go to the cross. And he told Jesus, he said, let me, let me explain something to you. You're not about to go to that cross. I will die for you. I won't let you go to that cross. I'm going to stand with you to the end. He said, Peter, let me tell you something. Satan's desired you, son, that he may shift you like wheat. Now watch this. And all of a sudden, the enemy is using Peter. Jesus looks at Peter and says, get thee behind me, Satan. Now watch this. He never woke up to his deception until he saw Jesus on the seashore, swam to where he was. Watch this. He comes out of his delusion. He comes out of his deception. When Jesus asked him not one time, but three times, Peter, do you love me? And on the third time, the scales fell off his eyes, and Peter recognized, oh, my God, I've been deceived. I've been in disillusion. I've been used by the enemy. Now I can see. I denied him three times because I thought I was somebody that I wasn't. The enemy have, was sifting me like wheat, but I woke up. And when he woke up, he repented. And because he repented, he's still being used by God to this very day. His life is a legacy, though he's dead and gone. And in heaven with King Jesus, his life has turned the world world upside down and still does to this day now watch this church watch this everybody blames Judas because they think Judas was an evil person Judas was just like every one of us in this room. Judas had a sin in his life, and it was called covetousness. You can find it that when, when Mary broke the alabaster ball and he got indignant, he said we could have used that money to feed the poor because the Bible said he was a thief. Everybody say he was a thief. And, and he, he was taking care of the, of the purser. He was taking care of the money for Christ. And, and, and he was covetous, the scripture says. And he was literally taking money. Now watch this. And the, and, and the Bible tells you and I, make no place for the devil. Everybody say it, make no place for the devil. When we allow things to remain in our lives, strongholds that we refuse to let God change in us, we open the door for the enemy to come in. Peter had pride. The enemy went through the door, sifted him like wheat till he come to a place that the pride was broken out of his life. If you'll let God, he'll change you. He is the master. Come on. He is, he is the potter. We are the clay. He is the master, and you're the masterpiece in the making. And if you'll let God, he'll change you. If you let God, he'll deliver you. It is a process, and you can't get off the potter's wheel. You've got to let God have his way in your life. Now, now, now let me go a step further. The Bible says that, 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 that the Judas was eating the Lord's Supper. Jesus, Jesus was telling them of his death. And the Bible said Satan entered Judas. Everybody say Satan entered Judas. He put it in his heart to deceive or to betray Jesus. After he had betrayed Jesus, the Bible said he came to himself literally and he hung himself because he couldn't live with the destruction that he had done as a result of being under the influence of Satan. How many of you in this room have ever woke up one day and went, what in the world have I just done? Why did I do that? Why did I go down that road? Why did I make these decisions? Because when we wake up one day, we've made a horrible, horrible decision that resulted in tragedy in our life. 
that resulted in, in, in the unraveling of finances, home, stability, future, dreams, hope, all over one moment of delusion. Has anybody ever done that besides me? And ever said, God, what did I just do? Why did I make this decision? Because we come under the delusion of the enemy. He influences us and he deceives us and he makes us think that our, right, uh, that our wrongs are right and our rights are wrong. And he begins to cloud our vision and our reasoning and our judgment. And he did the same. The difference between Judas and Peter was Peter got up, Peter repented, and Judas couldn't live with himself. Are y'all with me? <clears throat> Every one of us, if we walk with God, will fight this battle. Every one of us, if we live for Jesus, will one day have to make the decisions as to whether we choose to be deceived or we don't be deceived. But the Bible said they prevailed over him, over his deception because of three things. Number one, say this with me, the blood of the Lamb. Say it again, the blood of the Lamb. The reason that, that we overcome because of the blood of the Lamb, number one, is because he is our justifier. And the truth is it's the only hope for you and I to walk in truth and to walk in the light, and to walk in the power to change is through the power of the Holy Spirit. Nobody in this room can change themselves. Nobody in this room can straighten their life out. Nobody in this room can quit your addiction. Nobody in this room can, can beat your depression. Nobody in this room can overcome the anxiety on your own. You can't overcome the weaknesses of your flesh on your own. But I tell you through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can be changed. You can be transformed. You can be regenerated. You you can be delivered. You can be set free. But it only comes through the power of God. <clears throat> only God can change the heart of man. Only God can change the spirit of a man. And until you come to the throne of grace, you cannot be changed. Now here's the challenge. We think because we've messed up, we've done wrong, and Satan, say it with me, is the accuser of the brethren. He'll beat the daylights out of you with accusation. He'll make you feel like you can't come to the throne of grace. You're not good enough. You've made too many mistakes. you failed too bad. You're not good enough. You're not worthy enough. He'll beat you to death telling you why you can't, making every excuse. You know what people are going to say about you. You know what they're going to think about you. People are going to point their fingers at you. He'll use everything he can to accuse you, condemn you, and keep you away from the throne of grace. He'll use religious people. He'll use the Bible. He'll use scripture to come against you to keep you from coming to the throne of grace because the throne of grace is the only place where your life will ever be changed. So he tells you, you got to sit back there and you can't come to God because you failed too much. You messed up too much. You're not good enough. You're not worthy enough. They're going to talk about you. They're going to make up rumors about you. They're going to think less of you. God can never use you again. But all of that is a lie from the pits of hell. The devil is a deceiver. The greatest way that I can explain to you today about how powerful the blood of Jesus is. And the truth is, is that God's not about examining you. It's to tell you that in the old covenant, that when the, when the Israelites would bring their sin offering to the high priest, they had to bring a lamb that was without spot and was without flaw. It could have no defects in its body. If it had any defects, it would be rejected. The lamb or the goat had to be a perfect animal. It couldn't have any defects. It could have no diseases. It couldn't have any viruses. It had to be a perfect lamb. And in the same way, you need to understand something. That's why Jesus never sinned. He was the perfect, sinless lamb of God. That's why he was without flaw. That's why he was sinless and he never sinned. He never did any wrong because he had to be presented to the high priest of heaven as a, as a, as a, as a sheep without a flaw. When they would bring that offering, that sin offering to the high priest, the high priest did not examine the sinner. They didn't examine the sinner. He didn't come and say, what are your sins this year? He didn't come to examine all the faults in the person. He didn't look at the sinner. He looked at the lamb. 
Y'all are not hearing me preach today. He didn't look at the sinner. He looked at the lamb, church. He examined the lamb because the man was not the one that was being examined, but the lamb was being examined because the lamb was the propitiation for the sin. The lamb was the sin offering. The lamb was the justification. And when you bring your sins to God and you bring your life to the throne of God, God's not looking at you. He's looking at the perfect, sinless lamb of God. Because God knows that if you can't come to the Holy Spirit, there's no power to be changed. If you can't walk in communion with God, there's no hope for you to be changed. You have to walk in daily communion and fellowship and commitment to Christ to be changed. Say this with me it's a journey, not an event. Say it again, it's a journey, not an event. We want it all to happen in a microwave minute. Guys, Jesus didn't ask you to come to an altar, pray a microwave prayer. He said, follow me. And to follow me is going to require you to take up a cross every day. Now let me tell you what the second thing they overcome him by. They overcame him with the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. Everybody say the word of my testimony. That doesn't mean that I got up in front of a church and shared my testimony and that gave me power. That is not what that means. Let me explain to you what the word of our testimony means. The word of the testimony of what God has done in you and I. That our willingness and boldness to, to proclaim that this is how I was, but this is where I am. That this is what I came through, and this is how I came through it. It's the testimony to the power of God that says not only to me, but the person sitting next to me, that there is hope for you. There is power in a God to bring you through. There is power in God to restore your marriage. There is power in God to deliver you from your bondage. There is power in God to give you victory over the enemy. There is power in God to bring you through your pain. There is power in God to heal your body. There is power in, 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 in you for God to transform your life. Guys, we need to share the testimony of the power of God, not just from the Bible, but in today's reality right now, that what God brought you through, God will bring other people through. <clears throat> and the problem is, is we're not creating an atmosphere in our culture that is declaring the greatness of what God's brought me through. Because we don't have God active enough in our daily life that I'm here today because God healed my marriage. I'm here today because God healed my body. I'm here today because God delivered me from drugs. I'm here today because God broke the bondage of alcoholism and womanizing off of my life. I'm here today because God's changing my character from glory to glory to glory. That yes, my heart got broke. Yes, I got offended. But I'm here today because God healed my anger. I'm here today because God brought me through it. I'm here as a testimony that with God all things are possible Woo. And see when all of us begin to share this is who I am and this is why I'm who I am and this is how I got to be who I am look at me church I love everybody in this room this word is for relevate church and nobody else I'm not streaming this morning and I'm not streaming because this word is for you this morning Hear me loud and clear. There's too many of us that have become cowardly about where God's brought us from and how he got us through it. We've not shared our testimony. Had it not been for God, I wouldn't be here right now. Had it not been for God, my marriage wouldn't be here today. Had it not been for God, I would have got mad. I would have done something that robbed my character. But God stayed me. God kept me. God strengthened me. God sustained me. God was my present help in a time of trouble. Guys, we've got to share with the lost and the dying world the power of God that brought us through what we've come through. And not only that he did it then, but he does it still today, every single day. Yes, he delivered me from drugs, but let me tell you how he's delivered me from anger. Let me tell you how he's healed me from the hurt and the many wounds that have been afflicted and the knives that have been stuck in my back and the betrayals that I committed. But not only, let me tell you about the mercy that when I wasn't worthy, he counted me worthy, that he, I wasn't good enough, but he let me come to the throne of grace. I knew that I didn't deserve it, but he let me come because he looked at the lamb and not me. My God. Let me finish this up. Number three, 
Say this with me. We love not our lives unto death. Let me explain something to you today. I don't think I got much preach left in me. Our life is not just the air that we breathe in our lungs. See, the problem is when we think that we lay our lives down for God, we think that, I'm oh, I'm going to go be a martyr. Martyrs don't become martyrs when they're hung on a cross. And martyrs don't become martyrs when they're burned at the stake. Martyrs were martyrs long before they put them on a stake. Martyrs were martyrs when they gave up the things that were life to them at one time. Oh, y'all don't want to hear me preach today. See, life is everything around you. It's your social circle. Uh huh. It's your financial status and well-being. It's every aspect of what your life consists of. Uh-oh. Your stability, your hopes, your dreams, your aspirations, your hobbies, your likes and your dislikes. See, all of that makes up what we call life. Not just the air you breathe. That's just your existence. Your life is everything that makes up what you count dear and near to you. And see, when Christ asks us to take up our cross and deny our own selves, to give up our life that we could have his life, he said, I want everything. I want you to follow me no matter what it costs you. I want you to follow me if it costs you everything. If it costs you everything that's near, everything that's important to me, I want to be number one in your life. That there's nothing in your life that you will use as an excuse not to obey me. Because all of us, they say everybody has a price. But see, what is your price to not follow Jesus? Is it the fact that your kids will be angry with you? That your spouse won't love you anymore? That your family will, 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 will be angry with you because they feel that you chose to put God before them? Will it be because it's going to change your economical and financial status? Is it, is it because you, you know that the minute you follow Jesus that your social circle won't like you anymore? Is it that you know that you're not going to have the friends you used to have if you choose to follow Jesus? That if you choose to follow Jesus, there are certain things that you may have to walk away from and give up in your life? You see, the fact is, do we, do we, do we, are we like, are we like what, what, what the writer John says here? That we love not our lives unto death. It says, that, hey, listen, I, I, I'll be a martyr. But to be a martyr, you've got to have given up life to start with. Hello? You've got to let go of some things. Watch this. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I'll close with this. You can come, Jack. Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane, watch this. Or actually, whoever, I'm sorry, whoever's, I didn't, I apologize. Uh, Jesus says in the Garden of Gethsemane, watch this. No man takes my life. But I lay my life down. He didn't go begrudgingly. He didn't go back fighting. He prayed in that garden, Lord, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Not my will, but your will be done. Lord, I may not like the path that you lead me, but I'll take that path no matter what the cost is. No matter what people think about me, no matter what harm it brings me, no matter what pain or shame it brings me, God, I'm going to walk in your will. See, people all the time say Jesus wouldn't ask you to do that. People that make those statements are absolutely 100%, listen to me, no anger here, ignorant to the Bible. They are absolutely, totally uneducated as it relates to Scripture. Because when Jesus asked you to follow him, he said, hate your father, your mother, your wife, your children, or you cannot be my disciple. The word hate does not mean that I despise them, but I love them less than I love Jesus. So that means that as important to me as they are, they're not as, as important to me as the will of God. He said, some will come to me and say, Lord, I'll follow you, but let me bury my father. He said, son, let the dead bury the dead. I've heard every theologian and doctrine tiptoe around what that scripture really means. You know what that scripture really means? It means what it really says. Let the dead bury the dead. If I'm asking you to do something, that means miss your dad, daddy's funeral. Don't you put his will over my will. That's exactly what it means. One man said, I just got married. Lord, let me go and tend to the things that I need to take care of. And he rejected Christ to not follow him because he put his family before. 
Guys, I love my family more than everything, but I don't love them enough to put them before Jesus. If they tell me I can't and God told me I can't, I have to, then I'll have to go without them. My wife knows that. My family knows that. And it'll always be that way. It'll be that way to the day I draw my last breath. God's will first. God's will over my financial well-being. God's will over who likes me and don't like me. I've got a lot of enemies in this world that hate me because I put God's will over what they felt like I should have done in their behalf. When it comes to the music we sing in this church, to the people we minister to, to the churches I built, to the drug rehabs that we've established, I promise you I have lost friend after friend after friend. I have lost friends to tell me I shouldn't go to Africa. I should not do crusades. You need to stay away from those places. And when I wouldn't stay away from them because God sent me, they walked away from me. People pulled thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of support away from our churches because I chose to make decisions based on what God said and not based on their influence over my life. You see, people don't understand that God will ask you to do it every single day in your life. He'll ask you to put God above what other people think about you. They may hate you without a cause if you follow Christ radically. They may draw back from you, but you got to say, God, this is not my life. It belongs to you. You bought me with a price. And God, I have no other choice but to love you more than anybody else. I'm going to love them. It's going to break my heart, but God, I'm going to do your will. I'm going to cry, but I'm going to do your will. I may be broken, but I'm going to do your will. Because the truth is, is nobody could have ever done for you what Jesus did for you. If he's changed your life, you're so rooted in him right now. Because he broke the shackles off of your life. And you know today in your heart that he did more for you than you could have ever done in your own ability. And that God loved you when nobody else would love you. And when people gave up on you, he didn't give up on you. And when people walked out on you, he didn't ever walk out on you. When other people said, I couldn't walk with you no more, he kept walking. He was in the club. He was there. And as many times as you failed him, he never gave up on you. How can we not love him back with a surrendered, yielded life? How can we not go after him with all that we are? And to know that you're not good enough, but he makes you good enough. You're not qualified, but he makes you qualified. You don't have what it takes, but he's got everything you need. There's world changers in this room, guys. You're here to turn the world upside down. You're not here to attend church and just be a good Christian. You're here to be a warrior for the kingdom. You're here to be a vessel for God to use. If God could use this old jacked up, broken, messed up, hickory flat dude, man, he can use anybody. If God could take my inadequacies and my lack of education and my temper and all my junk and my addictions and change all that and use me. And let me tell you something, I ain't done it all right, guys. You can ask around. I ain't been perfect, but God uses imperfect people. The only reason he keeps using me because I refuse to quit. I just keep running to that throne of grace. I keep running to God saying, change me. My prayer is every day, God, change me. My prayer is every day, God, keep molding me. God, I'm not there yet, but I want to be, Lord. Just don't give up on me, God, because I ain't giving up on you. See, it's a decision you make every day. Every day, I take up my cross. Every day, I press on. Every day, you got to press in. God, God wants to do something big in his church today. I don't know what it is, but he wants to do something in your life today. He wants to pull the blinders off. He wants to take away all the deception. He wants to pull back the darkness from your heart. And he wants to set you free. He wants to make you somebody awesome for his kingdom, for his namesake. He wants to use you beyond your wildest dreams. Guys, our world is in trouble. Somebody's got to be a light. Somebody's got to rise up and say, I will not settle for status quo.